There's a story to be told, a future to behold. There is more to who we are than what they hear. We have love within our soul, fire in our bones. We've got everything it takes to make it here. There's much more within our soil, more than just our oil. We can grow the food to feed the whole world square. Agriculture is the key, there's treasure in the trees. The time is now, the land is green, wealth is here. has enough potential to cater for the growing population in Nigeria? What sector is bubbling with diverse and profitable opportunities? What sector can enhance the Nigerian economy and propel you to thrive? How can you tap into this sector? Be a part of the Business of Agriculture Masterclass coming up from the 5th to 7th of July 2021. Three days, nine sessions, 15 speakers and seven value chains. Tap into profitable opportunities in agriculture, build wealth, achieve financial freedom. Visit www.businessofagriculture.org and register for the free Business of Agriculture Masterclass designed to make you think agri. This is brought to you by the Private Sector Advisory Group of the UNSDG Fund. Well, well. Good morning, everybody. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is day three of the inaugural Business of Agriculture Masterclass. Uh, perhaps we may not know, but I'd like to say that uh, food consumption accounts for 57% of total consumption expenditure of the average Nigerian. Uh, providing food to over 200 million across the length and breadth of the country um, makes logistics and trade of agro-commodities uh, an important venture and a critical segment of the agricultural value chain. The seven hours of logistics says it all. There's the need to get the right products to the right customer in the right place at the right time, right condition and quantity. Welcome to the session on the business of agro-logistics and trade. 
I'm Ajibola Alfred, and I will be your moderator for this session. So how do we enable a crop or livestock farmer to sell their commodities to the most profitable uh, customer base with minimal loss? Answering this question involves several sets of activities uh, in getting agri-produce from the farm gate to the customer's plate. This includes uh, transportation transportation and transshipment uh, to wholesalers and retailers, storage and uh, warehousing of the items and uh, the mechanics of the actual sale um, within the country or externally. So because the goods or uh, commodities transported are by nature sometimes heavy, bulky or highly perishable, uh, they need to be transferred with adequate uh, efficiency from areas of production to areas of consumption uh, with the least delay, uh, with the uh, um, lowest cost and uh, high level of safety. But unfortunately, in farm and getting it to their plate. And much of this occurs during transportation and storage. Another critical issue is getting access to uh, the most profitable market locally or internationally. Reports have shown that uh, Nigeria's agriculture sector, um, the uh, Nigeria's ag agriculture exports have been growing. Um, however, they still remain the share of agricultural exports to total exports still remain very very low and um agriculture accounts for between 22 and 25 percent of the gdp so unlocking the potential in the agriculture sector is key unlocking the potential in the potentials in the logistics and uh, the agro logistics and trade value chain so this session will simplify the agro logistics and trade value chain and offer basic guidance on how to understand uh, the dynamics the dynamics of investing the dynamics of getting into the business as well as um, the, the key things the drivers of the business and the key things to understand We'll go on a short break shortly. Uh, we'll go on a short break now, and when we get back, we'll explore more on the agro logistics and trade uh, value chain in Nigeria. Thank you. Welcome back. Before we go to the panel discussion, let's welcome uh, a veteran in the logistics uh, and agro trade uh, uh, segment. Um, he goes by the name of uh, Mr. Ayodeji Balogun. Uh, he's the CEO of Actex Commodities Exchange Limited, where he's leading a team of experts leveraging technology, innovative finance, and inclusive agriculture to connect smallholder farmers to commodity and financial markets. IODG holds an MBA from Lagos Business School and formed a part of the first cohort of the Global CEO Africa program where he specialized in management. Mr. Ayodeji, it's nice to have you here. Uh, the Thank you very much, Thank you. Awesome, so much. awesome. Thank you very much, Ajibola. Really a pleasure. Are you gonna have the slides up? So it's interesting to talk um, in a very short time before we say, have our next TNC panel discussion around the business of logistics and agro-logistics and trade. Um, it is really important. I think everybody understands um, the context and importance of agriculture. Uh, both the role it plays for the foreign exchange income for the country, but also the resilience it provides to the growth 
over the last two or three recessions that Nigeria has gone through um, in, in the last two business cycles. Agriculture has remained the only sector that has proven the most resilient uh, despite the change um, that the sec all other sectors have gone through. Um, in a very, very simple manner, it essentially is the journey that goes from the farmer who is the producer to the market. Uh, and most, in, most, in most cases, you have multiple markets. Um, and then you go from the, the market to get to the uh, final consumer who is the... So essentially, we use this as a journey from the farm to the fork. Um, really looking at... Where we then, when you think of, um, but when you think of logistics at each of these nodes in the entire value chain, you always would think about the inbound and the outbound um, elements of the value chain. So at the farmer side, the inbound sides of that agro logistics will require how do you get the seeds, the fertilizer, the uh, CPPs that come all the way, whether imported or from local sources, uh, to the farmer's doorstep, including the major distribution hubs and the last mile logistics to get it to the farmer in his village. Um, today, Fat Nigeria moves about a, a, a million, uh, 1.2 to 1.5 million metric tons of fertilizer across the country every year. And most of this happens between May, June, and July. So if you look at that volume and you look at the, the, the value of logistics that happen there, you understand the magnitude and the level of activity, but also the importance the second part of it, when you get to the market, to move it from the market to the regional market and then the local markets, you also get to see how much of a value is. So the um, the entire logistics, the entire logistics um, uh, part of agriculture is about ten percent of the sector of the agricultural sector alone. So when you look at it from a value. Agriculture is 25% of Nigeria's economy. So about 2.5% of that is of the entire economy is the agro logistics or particularly uh, are focused on. Now, when we look at the export side, which is also very important, uh, when you look at our food imports, all the foods that we import are primarily wheat, um, our meal, dairy, and other products. All of them have to come in through an agro logistics hub. Uh, from the importation to through the ports, through the inbound logistics, through the distribution to get it to the primary markets that we're using. When we look at the key challenges around agro logistics, the so first is financial services, uh, primarily both at the last mile, which is how do you finance um, the you know the acquisition of logistics, the acquisition of trucks, uh, you go into the ships and badges. Uh, cold storage is another one that has, is one of the very important parts to reduce food harvest, which is for fresh fruits and vegetables about 45%, and for grains and cereals about 14%. Uh, but if you don't have a cold system uh, that can condition those products, you continue to waste this value um, year on year. But if we're able to unlock the right financing structure with the right patient capital to drive this, then we will start to see a more sustainable and less uh, uh, and more inclusive uh, food uh, logistics value chain. Infrastructure is a big one. Nigeria's port now is one of the least efficient uh, uh, globally. Um, you know, ports like Ghana and Togo now move a lot more volume of, of, of containers than we do in Nigeria. Access to market continues to be a big challenge across agriculture, where smallholder farmers are significantly uh, excluded, uh, severely excluded from the formal markets and can only rely on their neighborhood villages and to sell. Next slide. Institutional coordination really is another important one uh, because this is a lot of moving parts. Uh, if you look at the chain for maize to move from Kaduna, Katsina, where it's moved into the primary market, from the primary market into um, the major hubs like Mile 12, you know, and then from Mile 12, goes into this tertiary, you know, more retail markets and into the more formal food value chains. There's a lot of moving pits here and there's no uh, real-time visibility on how things are moving. So you continue to have a lot of wastages and delays um, um, along those different bottlenecks. 
Um, it, like every other business in the country, uh, when you look at the World Bank ranking on ease of doing business, Nigeria continues to stay at the real end. Um, you know, we've had a few improvements in the last two years, uh, but we're still far cry from countries like Rwanda, like Kenya, like Ghana, that have really invested and have moved up in the ease of doing business. Countries like Morocco today now have become regional hubs, and a country like Ghana is fast taking over from Nigeria being the regional hub for West Africa. Uh, if we follow the news in the last few weeks, we'll see that um, Toyota just established a manufacturing plant in Ghana with the primary purpose of building, assembling, and selling cars to Nigeria. Uh, but if you, if you focus on agriculture, um, Holland, for instance, has created their cocoa processing facility in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, where there is indeed an opportunity to there is indeed an opportunity to make the same investment in Nigeria. So, um, so we we continue to find ways to ensure that um, we can remain competitive within the sector because it then increases the profitability, but also um, the efficiency across the entire value chain. Next slide. And looking at different solutions, uh, uh, some of the challenges. Uh, what the sector needs uh, storage is a big concern both cold storage as well as dry storage uh, we need to start to think around better road networks both feeder roads as well as tertiary roads um, afct africa continental free trade agreement will make africa indeed the largest uh, trade hub and uh, trade block in the on the on globally so um if we are not able to ensure that we can control um we can control our road networks we won't be able to tap into this opportunity and move agricultural commodities across our interborders and interlands in the country uh we have to have better standardized warehouses apex um has been one of the pioneer in this storage as a service play where today we have over 80 warehouses across 20 states in nigeria and this warehouse serve both as our storage centers for smallholder farmers, but also market solutions where they could come, access finance, but also access markets to sell their produce to the wider market. Uh, we've also seen a lot of innovation in the last three to four years. Uh, Kobo 360, one pot, uh, which is an you know lorry systems and a few other ones who are integrated uh, logistic tech plays. Uh, who bring in both the hardware and the software to really bring in uh, radical changes into the logistics and agro logistics sector. Uh, some of them work mostly inland. Some of them also extend their services to um, operations and efficiency across the border. Um, this kind of innovations will continue to propel, uh, propel the growth of the agro logistics um, business. Next slide. And this slide just shows uh, the distribution of AFEX warehouses across the country. Uh, today, we work with over 200,000 smallholder farmers across eight different value chains. Uh, we are proud partners to the Nigerian Export Promotion Council on one of their very innovative and most very novel efforts, uh, which is around the warehouses um, for export. So you have warehouses that will start to serve as mini ports uh, within the country. And with some of these things, you start to, from your warehouse, get your ports clearing documents, one-stop shop where you can get customs, immigrations, and all of that services and documentation done, phytosanitary and all of those things. And once your port then sells to the port, it then increases and improves the efficiency uh, of which you're able to move this product. Uh, exports indeed today in Nigeria needs to grow, uh, you know, by tenfold in the next few years for us to be able to continue to sustain the foreign exchange income that we need to run and, and feed our growing population thank you very much over to you Ajibola. wow uh, that was a scintillating uh, presentation out there. Um, you nailed it. You, uh, that was a brilliant 
agro logistics and uh, trade um, segment of the business of agriculture. Thank you. Um, so uh, to help you better appreciate the agro logistics sector, I'll be talking to um, to uh, two experts, IODG inclusive, uh, IODG inclusive, and I mean we have two people, one a practitioner and the second a government official, and I think that's the best we can have to really do justice to this topic. Um, so we'll take a deep dive into choosing the right niche to venture into the agrologistics and trade uh, space. Uh, we'll try to understand the agrologistics market. We'll try to uh, um, also get tips on starting an agro business as well as how to invest in the agro uh, logistics and trade business. Uh, in the Welcome back. So I trust you are anticipating an impactful uh, session uh, because yes, we are just getting started. Uh, we have a number of experts with us. I mean, we have two experts with us uh, to uh, analyze this industry uh, for the purpose of uh, providing insights, especially for both investors and entrepreneurs. Uh, our first panelist, of course, needs no further introduction. That's uh, Mr. Ayodeji, who gave that brilliant uh, uh, presentation. Ayodeji, of course, is uh, a practitioner. He's been through it. He's, uh, he started a business and taken it to, uh, uh, to higher levels. And so that's also an inspiration for many of us who are watching this. Um, uh, what I mean, the presentation is still fresh on our minds. Uh, Mr. Ayodeji, welcome back again. Um, our second panelist is Mr. William Eziagu. Uh, he is presently the director in charge of uh, product development at the Nigerian Export Promotion Council, NEPC, Abuja. He has mentored new exporting companies uh, to venture into export business. Mr. Eziagu also has uh, uh, has worked as an advisor on agribusiness for the World Bank Assisted Commercial Agricultural Development Program, which is CADP. Uh, is he, I mean, and also as the national expert for, for value chains under the UNIDO NQIP project who has quality certifications and these are key areas of the chains and so you're welcome Mr. Isiago. Can you hear me sir? You're welcome. Thank you very much moderator. Um, I want to appreciate you for this uh, invitation and uh, the, the forum and also want to thank other panelists okay. and uh, participants and listeners. Thank you. Great. Great. So it's a pleasure to have you all for this session on the business of agrologistics and trade. Again, uh, going forward, I'll be asking specific questions around the dynamics of starting, which is market entry, and thriving in the, in the agrologistics business. Um, this is, I mean, the questions would, would help to spotlight um, uh, the, the opportunities and, is, and give insights into the value chain. Um, uh, into the value chain. So I'll start with uh, Mr. Ayodeji, since as a practitioner, you know, what would you say uh, is the best way to enter this business? Or how does one uh, find a niche to play in? I know, of course, you have, uh, your operations are large, but I guess, of course, you started from somewhere before you expanded to this level. And so perhaps you can give us some very good insights to uh, how to get into uh, so, a part of the uh, niche. The answer in one word is small. You know, the answer in one word okay. is small. The, the way to start is small. And um, 
a lot of times when you think about things, you always want to go big and large and think of the efficiency. You see? Uh, but then there are always learnings that will be made over time, you know, within the space as you grow it. Uh, when we started in 2013, after work, After we were launched um, uh, within a, as a partnership with the Federal Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Development, what we did was to do a leasehold to the PPP for seven warehouses. Um, and those seven warehouses was across the geographic zones that we wanted to, to serve. Um, and that was the initial point where we started. Over time, we started to build and scale this into additional facilities, rented private ones, had partnership with other state governments, and now we're at the point where we've started to build uh, and, and invest massively in standard international storage centers. Um, but if you look at the risk of starting and the learning uh, versus the skill, I always advise businesses to say, you know, there's a 30, 30, 30% 30 rule that I say you start. Uh, put your first 30% in to start, and uh, then put your second 30% in to learn, and then put your last 30% in to scale. Interesting. Interesting. So uh, can I also ask that um, uh, you pitched uh, like four segments or five segments of that value chain. Uh, which of those do you play in and uh, which would you um, advise that one starts with? Did you get so we, you know, so two broad spaces when you look at the agro logistics. So first is, you know, yes, I did here. Can you hear me? Oh yes, I can. Please go ahead. So there are two broad, there are two broad areas in agro logistics. So you have the cold value chain and you have the dry value chain. So the dry value chain is things like rice, maize, soya beans, uh, and all pulses and legumes and the likes. Those commodities can stay in a room temperature warehouse for close to a year, some a little less, some a little more. Um, but then you still have to manage fumigation, manage moisture levels, manage pest control, and those other things. You have the cold value chains for like the dairy sector, the vegetables, uh, the livestock uh, sectors. Those are a lot more perishable. And typically you have between four hours to sort of 24, 48 hours to be able to move them from the beginning to the end of the logistics. Um, definitely, we play in, in the dry value chain, and it is a lot easier to double your hands in and manage because you're not working against nature. Um, and then we understand the issues around power, uh, cold chains, transportation, you know, and all. Oh, well, it looks like uh, we lost uh, IODG briefly there. Um, I might as well just go to uh, post the question. Okay, okay. How did you, you come so, from where so, you stopped? So definitely, uh, I, I wouldn't say there is a better place to start, whether cold or, 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 or dry, but I would say it is easier to manage the variables in the dry value chain. In the wet value chain, you have a lot more variables. But then if you have integrated alliances, you have investments and you can manage the risk, the opportunities are also larger, the margins are also larger than in the dry value chain. Thank you, Ajibola. Okay, thanks. Um, that's a good one. Um, I think I would uh, go to Mr. Ezeagu, uh, given his experience and also as uh, uh, a government official in this area, uh, and I would like to ask, what are the key, what are the dominant uh, challenges within the value chain that uh, one should be wary of? And uh, what are ways to manage or mitigate these challenges? Thank you very much, um, uh, the moderator, for the opportunity. And I also want to thank the panelists and listeners as well that's on the platform. Um, for agriculture, um, whether you're talking of challenges, of course, there are challenges, just like in any other profession or any other activity. Well, however, uh, the challenges are what you can work on. Because if you're talking of challenges, I have the, uh, Mr. 
Odele, who found uh, who is working on Apex. Um, at least by now, if you should have run away, but he's working <laughs> on it and try to find solutions. <laughs> yes. So um, I want to appreciate everybody again. Now, for 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 agri process, agri business. I call it agri business yeah. because it comprises a lot of uh, its, its components. If you're talking of agri business, you have, of course, you have the um, the cash crop, the food crops. You have the then, of course, you have the agro processing. That transformation of the product into a value-added product, which many Nigerians are doing right now, and it's very key to us. And of course, the ancillary services, definitely like the logistics, the and other things that follow around it. So this that is a it's a spectrum of uh, of activities. So I don't know the value, um, the at what point or the value are we looking at at now? But I will, I want to concentrate on agri processing or value addition. Okay, um, which whereby, whereby the SMEs, um, SMEs are really engaged right now, and that's where the FAS is in. We have been doing a lot of export of cash crop, a lot of food crops, and all that. The cashew, the cocoa, the sesame seed. These are massive um, crops that are going on, which a lot of I mean, investors are going in right now. And it's an, it's an area because if you want to do, um, for example, export of those products, you can now start uh, going to that area. So it's key that you also venture in that area. But many are do transforming products from, from nowhere to somewhere. So people are now using the natural product we are dealt with. Something like sesame seed, transforming it to paste, transforming tiger nut, transforming uh, uh, date, uh, date, you know, uh, all these dabinos, they're transforming them, they're transforming a uh, cashew nut, transforming. These are where of uh, spices, a lot of uh, I mean, spices. Even, uh, if, you know, a lot of products. People are transforming this product now to a value-added product and creating a niche for themselves. I think that is where we should, uh, we, we, I'm, I'm going to actually look at, because that's where the opportunities are, because there you are not competing with anybody. If you, if you are exporting cocoa, you are competing with um, exporters from Ghana, you are exporting from Cote d'Ivoire, you are exporting from you know, Ecuador, you are from Cameroon and all that. If you are exporting sesame seed, you are competing with people from Sudan, from Ethiopia, from Tanzania and all that. But if you, are, if you create your own product, if you create your value, your own value, you are competing with yourself. So you will begin to work at yourself. I mean, look at yourself. So that's actually the core area I'm looking at. And I want to say that what I'm talking is not challenges actually, but it's opportunity. It's opportunity. Um, look at how many Nigerians are outside the country today. They want to eat Nigerian food. They want to eat things from Nigeria. And that's a big opportunity. That was for a market in the US, in the UK, in Japan, in everywhere. Nigerians are everywhere. And they want to eat our product. How do we get this product to them? How do we transform this product to them? People want to eat pandan yam. They don't want to. They don't have the opportunity to go and start pandan buying yam and no. They want to the product they can just put in their pot and turn it and transform to food. People want to eat, you know, the local food. I mean, I mean, you know, this kind of food I'm talking about. So this is that kind of thing. How do you transform them? How do you transform this product to a to put into a package? Try to quality and all that. That is where the opportunity. So can I, so can I, Sorry, sorry to interject. Uh, sorry to interject, Mr. Eziago. Yeah. So yeah. assuming, I mean, after these products have been uh, processed and been transformed, and yeah. um, assuming I'm in the business of logistics of taking this transformed, pro uh, this processed goods, you know, across the length and breadth of Nigeria, and that is a niche, an area I want to go into. What? Do you think at my challenge, what are the kind of challenges I'm going to face in doing this? Especially knowing that, um, uh, knowing how important logistics is, because it's central to uh, getting this from, uh, getting this processed goods to the consumer's plate. Thank you very much. In terms of logistics, I think um, it's critical. Without logistics, the product cannot get to the consumer. And so it's very, very key uh -huh. that the uh, logistics is taken care of. And that is why today, like I just like I just to align it to what I was actually saying before, that is the logistics that actually is the key to bringing this product from the farm or from the factory to the market, whether it's export market or the domestic market. So it's key. And that's why actually in Nigeria today, few challenges, for example, the Lagos sport issues there. And that led us to what to develop what to call the export uh, domestic export warehouse because of those challenges. Of course, you know, you're moving uh, goods from Kanu to, uh, to Potakot or, you know, or Kanu to Lagos, a lot of traffic on the road, a lot of, um, you know, securities trying to ensure that what you're carrying is not contraband or something. So there are a lot of issues that involve. So 
these kind of uh, issues. So that actually led us to establish what we call the domestic export warehouse. Mr. Ayodele, you said it you know, in, in, when he was uh, making his presentation. What is this export warehouse? We call it do in, in, in short form. The export warehouse is export, domestic export warehouse, whereby we we'll get a warehouse in warehouse facilities and other, and other services in any place. It's not going to, it's anywhere. That means it's mainly the heat island anyway, whereby goods can be aggregated in that warehouse. Inspection takes place in that warehouse. Customs inspected, um, federal produce inspection inspected. They don't need to go to Lagos. They don't need to go to Lagos and sign the warehouse there in Lagos that will cost money, that will cost time, and not. No. If it's in Kaduna, if it's in Sokoto, if it's in Enugu, anywhere the warehouse is, we have custom, we have the NQS, we have the, all the people, whatever you would have done in Lagos would have been done that place. And the container is just, you know, certified by the security agent because there also be police there. And the, once the container is locked, there's a logo they're going to put on it. That oh, it's a due operator or due uh, certified operator. It's the same vehicle that will carry it also will be certified too, so that the vehicle will also be carried that look. So what the product, the, the vehicle and the container move from say so Kano, I'm just using this example, going to Lagos or anywhere, nobody will stop that motor. Nobody, okay? Because we have sensitized all the people that are supposed to work on it. That is it. What are we trying to do there? Is to reduce the logistical problem, you know, to reduce the constraints of logistics. Mm -hmm. Know that. Okay, the road is, once the vehicle leaves uh, the, from the origin or the warehouse, it goes straight. But remember this: he will not go to Lagos until he called by MPA, you know, and, it, and, and so through the what you call the platform known as uh, Eto, Eto, Eto Color. So, okay, that's the that's, platform. Uh, that's absolutely yeah, so interesting. Connected to MPA, so MPA will not will not just leave Lagos and I mean leave uh, wherever you are, go to Lagos and start piling on the Jorado, I mean the Jorado and and start blocking the road and so all those areas there. Say two days, three weeks. You have to say, no, you don't need to do that. You wait until when it's your time, they will tell you the day I'm trying to come enter the port. And so you, you move. You know, so with that, you reduce the constraints of all these problems. We have number one, stoppage in here and there, open the day. What do you what are you carrying? Open the open your container, drop there, no. And when you get to Lagos, you go straight to the port. So I think that is actually say it's a milestone for us, and uh, we're working as serious. Yes. So that's that's interesting, and and yes, that's a milestone. That's um, that would do a lot in uh, the risking that sector. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, however, that takes me to my next question, which is the fact that it is coming from the government angle, but it's also a business uh, for the private sector. So, assuming an individual wants to go into the business of warehousing or some form of storage. Um, what should they be looking at and uh, how would the person identify customers, off-takers and, uh, and target markets? This question is for uh, Ayodeji, being uh, the entrepreneur here. Yeah, uh, I think Digi is on mute. Apologies. So three different areas Thank you. across the value chain, and I'll just highlight the different opportunities in these three different points and how you can position yourself as an entrepreneur uh, mm -hmm. to, to provide these services. So one is right um, at the upstream side, which is at right next to the farmer, and uh, we call those business model farmer aggregation services. Uh, here you can have a warehouse in areas that are in clusters of producers. Um, it could be producers of any of the crops. Uh, we've had aggregators for milk, we've had aggregators for rice, we've had aggregators for maize and other crops, even like livestock and poultry uh, outputs. And what you essentially are doing is that you're trying to fix um, the post-harvest or post-processing part of the value chain. Right from when it leaves the harvest, uh, the farmer, uh, and then you take it right from there. Primarily, you would want to be able to condition it, particularly if it's for fresh vegetables. For something like poultry, you would want to be able to clean it, dress it, and package it. Uh, but if it's something like grain, you want to make sure that it is in the right type of bags. Something like cocoa, it's in a jute sack. It is well labeled. It probably has a traceability tag. And you can store it managing this phytosanitary, managing the pest issues, managing the moisture issues that is embedded. Now, there are other adjunct businesses like trading, 
uh, like logistics, like uh, marketing, that you can also bundle it to make it profitable. Uh, but essentially, your primary customers were going to be the producers, uh, be the farmer for grains or, 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 or a fish uh, pond or a, or a poultry farmer. Now, the second, which is sort of like the meat tier, is more a trade, uh, uh, a, a trade or a distribution chain. And we've seen a lot of variation of these services, and all of them seem very interesting. So the traditional model where you are in a major market or a major trading center, for instance, there was no market in Kano, or you have a large warehouse in uh, Daliko market in Mushi, or somewhere in Bodija market in Oyo, uh, or any of these markets or major agro trading hub. And then your primary services is to provide storage um, either to major sellers that are bringing the products to them and distribute within your you know, tertiary markets, or you are there to buy from major ops, hold it there, and then redistribute it. Um, so either of the different business models uh, do work. One of the things we started seeing, which is what actually happens in, in a lot of in, you know, in developed and developing markets, and we started to see here, is where you then bring in the story as a service play. So you have companies now that will take a large warehouse, put in storage racks, maintain it, put in the best uh, inventory management systems, are uh, putting you know weight lifters and things like that and then they provide those shelf spaces available for companies so you either have multinational companies or people importing products or even the e-commerce space which is growing at about 20 percent uh, uh year on year uh then take on some of the services and use those points as a transshipment point uh this is an emerging trend and it's a very interesting and i think this is one of the things where you can also bring in technology you can bring in internet of things to play, to drive efficiency and create more value. Uh, the last part that I'll talk on, which is a new emerging trend, a lot more capital intensive, uh, but you're seeing a lot more variants of it, but it's a huge opportunity that we call. So one of the things we've started to see over the last three to five years um, around the port operations is the emergence of private mini ports. So we all understand the challenges in Apapa and moving either to Twinkan or the Nigerian ports uh, to get their products out. Yeah, so some of the things we are now seeing is uh, people are setting up uh, in the uh, inland waterways, setting up mini port operations that could then load containers onto a barge. And then the barge also, another part of the business model, then moves the container from that side port into the main port. So you, 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 you short circuit the entire operations of trying to get into the port, managing all those paperwork, and you go by water, and you either come back to the port or you go right onto the IC and drop your container into onto the port. So what could be a 21 day process becomes a three or four day process for you. A lot more expensive, but as a agro logistics player, that is another imagined opportunity that people could start to come in, either as a capex player to build in the entire infrastructure or to come in to leverage existing capex players and just provide the services um, on top of that. I hope this was helpful, Ajibola. Wow, that's quite helpful. Thank you very much, Dejit. I mean, that shared a lot. I, I believe a lot of people would have. Uh, 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 there's a lot of take homes in that in that explanation for the fact that now uh, you just uh, demystified the whole warehousing and the whole storage um, industry. And I mean, it shows that more and more people can get into it even even the, the 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 tech community can actually i mean actually has a space in it so it's not just about farmers and only agro people but of course um it's an all commerce affair everybody has a role to play and the opportunities are bound so that's a good one Thank yeah very much. very, very um, important very yeah. important Ajibola, because a lot of times when we think of logistics we only think of trucking and which is exactly why I did yes. not mention it. There are so many more, so many more services and opportunities that you can leverage and build. There's insurance, there's maritime insurance, which is a trillion dollar economy globally. Uh, there is freight forwarding, which is another massive sector. There's so many parts of this agro logistics hub that we could look at as a, you know, enlightened, educated, uh, uh, particularly the youth, the young and talented people can come in and start to innovate and invest here 
it just doesn't have to be buy a truck and put it on the road and, and start to haggle with your driver and your mechanic. <laughs> okay, great. Great. Thank you. Yes, that one that scores the fact that um, there's a lot of opportunity. If you even look at just commodities alone, um, the rice market itself is uh, uh, about uh, the consumption value of rice in Nigeria. It's uh, about two trillion naira on its own, which says that that shows that there's a lot of opportunity and there's a lot of mouth feed. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the next question will be for Mr. Eziagu, uh, and that is about how to uh, identify customers, uptakers, and target market for uh, the export of uh, local trade, uh, local agro products. Thank you very much. Local uh, market for uh, agricultural products. I think is uh, is the core function of any what any piece. Agro logistics business. Yeah. Okay. okay, so agro agro logistics. No, for agro logistics business. Uh, yes. Agro. Okay. So how does one identify the uh, the customers, you know, uptakers, or I mean, a target market itself to say uh, it can be by products or by uh, or or ge geographical. You know, perhaps you can just expand okay. on that. Okay. I think actually the to, for you to get a, a service provider for logistics, I think what more yeah. what, uh, what you've been looking at is the products. What product are you offering? I mean, do you have? Okay. Um, and of course, the the you also be looking at uh, the quality of the service to be delivered by the you know, service provider. You're also looking at the geographical um, the mode as well. The mode is key. Um, is it by rail? Is it by road? Is it you know? Also looking at the, the the type of product that you are going to move because the product is like I you know, said where there's wet and dry. If you are doing vegetables, you must look for um, refrigerated containers or refrigerated trucks. Okay, and that's one of the challenges where you mentioned challenges. Yeah. And that's the key challenge. We're moving product, uh, fruit and veg from, um, for example, you're moving oranges from Benue State, you know, to Lagos. At the end of the day, you see all this J5 that uh, you know, that's are very old and rickety. By the time it gets to one hill, it's just uh, you cannot climb the hill, and it just uh, so it's key that you let's look for a refrigerated truck that can move that product for sa for safety as well as to to put the, the to let it be the state where it's supposed to be. They have, they have in the recommended temperature so that it goes. So those are kind of things you'll be looking at. You're also looking at you know the the cost. Of course, is key. How much is um, you know logistics is now becoming more expensive because of a lot of factors. You know which again. We just look solution to. So actually, there are a lot of um, an entrepreneur or an exporter looking for a, a logistic provider or how to take off his product. Must effect, like I said, must do a due diligence. Due diligence. Who are the, because from what the presentation he made, we can see a lot of them, uh, especially in the, some are doing the uh, offline now uh, and online. You see the point. I think I said the 1.360 robo transport. You know all those kind of people. So. You must know them because actually one of the problem we have is that many people don't even know who are these um, service providers in terms of logistics. Okay, and uh, so we, the information is key. So once uh, enough information, we have to get these people and what kind of uh, service they provide. You know, some do soft, uh, soft and small packages, parcels, courier, and others. Some do medium, uh, medium, medium size. You know, maybe 10, 10 tons, twenty tons, and thirty tons. So they have trucks that can handle that. Some have bigger. You know, uh, uh, space. I mean, where you can do hundred tons, two hundred tons. You know, to move it to the from hinterland to the port. So these are these are kind of uh, things we'll be look, considering. How, where, where, where can I? Uh, what kind of uh, of the provider do I need, and how can I go about? Of course, look at insurance. That's some services. He mentioned insurance. You cannot do trans um, logistics without insurance because what happens on the road? Assuming the container has problem or your vehicle, the vehicle has problem, there's a, a you know accident and all that. So con um, insurance. To, to to do to do that, of course, warehouse, like he said, is also key because these are things you must have. Look for a service provider that have these facilities. You know, a good warehouse is key for you to because it moves your product from somewhere to somewhere. If it, if it, if it, if it doesn't get a, a, enough facility, it might have challenges. So these are key things. You, of course, regulation is also key and quality as well. Quality is key. Uh, quality of the provider is also key because your quality, as a, your product, is on a quality basis. 
Let me say it and say it clearly. Your, quality, your product is on quality basis. You're exporting a product. Maybe there's a moisture content that you're supposed to deliver to your customer. There's um, you know, um, parameters you have to deliver. So moisture is very key. So as we have a service provider that, can, that is carefree, you know, oh, it's the same thing. It's why I carry uh, Mama this man yesterday. It's why I'm carrying. No, you must have the one that knows, understand the product, understand the nature of your product. If it's a wet product, you must, you know, be able to protect it from, you know, getting, uh, you know, getting spoiled. If it's a dry product, you must protect it from getting um, a moisture, you know, it's ingression in moisture. So those are key. Of course, the packaging also key. If you are packaging a cultural product, you must also know the concept of packaging. In other words, how do you package? If it's a fragile goods, if it's a breakable goods, if something, so it must also have that at back of mind. Then label, you have to also label properly. Labeling is key to say that, oh, this product is, uh, do not uh, drop, uh, you know, do not drop, or say, you know, the same way is they label this thing, so that you have the, the, the provider who is uh, carrying the product, the logistic provider knows, oh, this product is, you know, is, um, is, is not good to be dropped anyhow, it's not good to be exposed and all that. So these are kind of factors that um, any service, any person that is any entrepreneur or somebody that needs this, this is also consider. Thank you. Thank you so much. Because um, I like the fact that you also spoke about labeling, spoke about packaging, which are critical aspects of uh, logistics and aspects of getting um, uh, of moving products around and getting them to the customer's plate. Yeah, uh, that's quite critical. Uh, and also for the fact that uh, post harvest losses are, uh, are just as high, especially for perishable goods. Uh, we, I mean, they could be as high as 60%, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, across the board. And I, I believe logistics serves as a very, I mean, logistics, I mean, the whole uh, segment, taking everything from packaging, labeling, uh, the logistics, warehousing, storage, uh, bringing them all together. If we can have more practitioners, we will go, it will go a long way in, uh, in um, solving the post harvest losses uh, problem. Uh, so that's a very good one, Mr. Eziagu, and thank you for that. Uh, my next question will be to DG, and that will be with regards to the risks associated with agro-logistics and trade businesses. I mean, we all know what it takes to be an entrepreneur. It's not, uh, it's not beans, as they say. And it's important to, to know what risks one, what one is delving into. And then sometimes it's capital intensive, even though we know that there are areas where that is not exactly as capital intensive. But no matter what, it's still a risk that one is taking. So what exactly are the uh, risks associated with this uh, segment of uh, the value chain? Are you with me? Hello? Hello? Uh, looks like I... I think they just... I did get your up. question. Uh, okay, no, so I, I was talking about question. risks associated with... All right. Okay, all right. So it's, 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 it's it's definitely like entrepreneurs um this is one of the business that we are in uh, managing risk and uh you know taking advantage of it um so you would have things that are um, associated with thefts you would have things that are associated with um, destruction of the capital asset itself you would have things that are associated with destruction of third party assets uh, if you have a truck on the road and he has an accident with a car for instance, you have things associated with uh, spoilage and damages, either way in the warehouse, be it in transit or be it in the, loca in the exit location. Uh, depending on where you operate, whether it's upstream or downstream, you also have sort of security risks, um, which is something that is of bigger concern uh, for this sector um, in the country at the moment. Uh, you have issues, for instance, uh, the NSAS uh, protests um you know and the and the resultant sort of maneuvering of that process and the backlash he had on players in the logistics value chain uh if you were any significant player either in the agro or probably the entire logistics value chain throughout that week uh you probably your blood pressure may have gone up by a few points 
uh, just waiting to see whether or not you'll be a victim. Um, and, and these risks are real. Now, a lot of them are manageable uh, from insurance products. Uh, so for instance, we have six different insurance covers that we have for our entire operations. Uh, so we have uh, professional uh, uh, indemnity, which says when the staff defrauds the system, we are insured against that. We have a public liability, which means that when our property destroys a public property, the insurance will cover for that. Uh, we have goods and transit insurance. So if you have a truck that goes missing, uh, that covers for that particular insurance product. We have fire and, spe uh, and special peril, which means fire and burglary, uh, meaning fire damages or, or burglary theft or stuff. Uh, we have special perils, uh, which means that when you have maybe flood, natural disasters, uh, volcanic eruptions, that is covered. Uh, we have a sixth one now, which we started last year, uh, which is like the anti-riot, anti-protest type of cover that says when you have uh, civil unrest, uh, you have an insurance cover for them. So these are six different types of insurance. This doesn't even include like the uncultivation insurance that we have to get when the farmer is producing um, and, and how we have to manage all of those. So um, so this, so you can bring in from insurance and that's one half of how to manage the risk. The other part of how you really need to also be able to manage the risk is around your processes. So having standardized SOPs um, that say that you could, you know, if you do these things uh, in a predictable and process manner, it's almost like lean processing. Your outcomes are predictable and can be managed. So that's also one of, you know, the probably so you're preventing it happening rather than you're managing the implication when it has happened. Uh, the third part, which is becoming even more important around risk, is that you could get all the products to the final processor. We call it Nestle. Let's say you take milk or you take cocoa and you deliver it to Nestle. Uh, it's gotten there. They've produced it into a finished The finished product then goes to the... Okay, um, we don't have so much time. Uh, while waiting for IODG to reconnect, Mr. Eziago, uh, can you just in one minute, and I mean, I mean one minute, uh, straight to the point, can you quickly tell us uh, how to get local and international customers for agribusinesses interested in export? Local and international um, customers for agribusinesses interested in export. Yes, I think um, for you for you to enter the international market or local and national market, actually, you must have the product. And so the quality minute, of the please. product is key. Yeah. So you must be able to produce a product that is the customer's want. So in, in that means that okay. you, must, you must be able to develop a niche for yourself. Okay? Uh, that niche must brand. It's better you have a branded product. It helps you to, uh, to okay. command the market. Okay, once you have the right product, I, I, I want to say that quality is key. And that quality is not just by say, by say, by mouth. You must be able to certify. You must be able to have a connection with a certification. Okay, for Nigerian packet, NAVDAC is key. If it's SON, is key. If it's whatever, but it's good to have. But for, in addition to that, you also advisable, especially if you are going for a sport market, to have what we call voluntary certification. What is voluntary certification? Voluntary certification and certification, they are not compulsory for you to get, like on like NIFDAC. NIFDAC is mandatory, it's voluntary. Because you must have it. Voluntary means you don't you, you, you don't need it. What is key to you? For example, the ISO 9001. So, sir, uh, for example, yes. okay, sir, sir, assuming all my certifications, I mean, I have all my documentations complete and all, but yes. how do I identify an international customer Identify How a customer. Do I identify yes to okay. my customers. Hello, yes, I, especially uh, you hearing me? especially international. Yes, yes, I can hear you. Especially international customers. Yes, I can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll I'll come back to how to identify 
uh, international customers and as well as local. But I think I'll just uh, quickly get back to Deji and say what are the skills and competence if you can just give this to me in one minute because uh, we are short of time at the moment. Uh, the skill and competence required to thrive in this sector. Please, one minute. So first, you must understand the basic tenets of running a business. Um, second, logistics is a is a core skill, and you have to learn uh, the processes of tracking, monitoring. Uh, the third is the marketing side. You have to grow your revenues, and when you want to grow revenues, you must be able to sell your products and get new clients. Mm, great, that's something. I like that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and also, um, so. Talking about investing in uh, agriculture, I mean, uh, just of recent, uh, the SEC had to stop a lot of people doing, you know, private investments on their own without getting, um, without recourse to SEC. Um, what are critical signals of a healthy, investable agro logistics uh, and trade business? And also, what are the things one should take into consideration in deciding whether or not to invest in an agro logistics and trade business. So three things. Um, the first, one of the very important rules of investment is too real, too good to be true is always too good to be true. So if it's too good to be true, then <laughs> it's not. Um, I don't it's do a business that pays, uh, yeah, uh, that pays yeah, that pays 30% in in 30 days or in 90 days. Mm -hmm. it, I don't just think it exists, uh, not in this part of the world. Um, so that's definitely one thing that uh, is a very obvious red flag uh, that we all must know. The second is what I would always check is that um, go and look at what is the infrastructure that they have to support, uh, you know, the fund they are raising. So if somebody is raising a hundred million naira today, um, you know, if you understand that it takes about a hundred thousand hectares to cultivate an hectare of grain, it means that person needs to be able to manage you know ten thousand hectares of operations and knowing that you need one person to about 50 to 500 hectares so i mean what's the staff strength what's the people strength what is the number of legwork that they have to manage the physical infrastructure what are the logistics infrastructure that they've invested in to be able to sustain that level of capital when you don't see those things uh, that's a second red flag uh, the third and the last part of it is sustainability. What's the track record that they've built? Uh, what alliances do they have? What is the role of regulation? Uh, when you as an investor are going into a market that is unregulated, you also know that you are playing in a higher risk market than a market that is regulated. So all of these things are immediate red flags that stick to us as investors, and we should ask a lot more questions. Okay, before I allow Mr. Eziago to wrap up on... Uh... Uh, the uh, on how to identify customers. I would just quickly like to ask you again, I mean, just to, to wrap up on the, this investment part, is uh, how do I discover investable agro-logistics and trade businesses? What, how do I put my, what do I look at? How do I discover them? Is that for Mr. Iziago, Ajibala? Uh, that's for you. I'm coming back to Mr. Ezeago to wrap up on the identification okay. of so, customers. Um, I always say start from what you know and move to what you don't know. Um, so for me, I'll say what are the relationships I have, what are the alliances I have, and um, are there opportunities that we can find from there. So if I have a partner that has a poultry um, and I know that I have that relationship, I can start to think of a beef or a, a livestock processing plants and then the distribution of that it is very important to you know they say family friends and fools are very important in the in the life of every startup so how are you going to find that family that friend or that fool uh, that will be able to give you an opportunity to start to build on one word is relationships what relationships? so mr is there a goal? Uh, uh, okay, so Mr. Ezago, I'll give you an opportunity to round up with uh, uh, what you were saying about how to identify uh, a customer, especially at the international level. And again, what is the leg regulatory landscape, landscape around agro logistics and trade related businesses? I know, of course, uh, 
I know, of course, uh, uh, for you to go into logistics, especially transport, you will need uh, to register with the NURTW and so on. But can you just give us like a, a general regulatory landscape uh, just in two minutes? But before then, uh, please just finish with uh, what you were saying about how to identify a customer, an international customer. Can you hear us inside the room? Hello? Can Mr. Isaac hear us? Okay, no. Uh, but but did you uh, be interested in answering that question, uh, the regulatory as well as maybe identifying customers abroad? But uh, to a large extent, maybe the regulatory uh, environment. Yeah, so the Ministry of Transportation is, um, I I'll say, it depends on where you start from. So um, at, the, at the right top end uh, downstream of uh, maritime shipping, you have the Shippers Council, you have the, um, so that, that space is very well regulated, um, you know, with institutions, and then you have a Ministry of Transportation. Um, as you come to the mid-site system where you have the badges, the, the inland movement, uh, the large trucks moving, the railway system. You also have, you know, it's a bit smaller, less regulated, uh, more sort of self-regulated rather than uh, government regulated. Uh, but you still have the local governments, the parks, uh, the state governments play quite a bit of a role, um, both in working with the, you know, associations and industry trade associations, but also in collecting le levies and wages and things like that. Uh, but a lot more can be done. As we come down to uh, sort of the real upstream, um, there's very little, if at all, any regulation. Even when you look at things around food safety, uh, health hazards, uh, standardization of warehouses, storage, park streets, markets, um, I think that's not been managed. And I think that's one of the uh, shoot out of the weak local government systems that we've had, because those things are supposed to be managed uh, are coordinated by the markets. Okay, okay, great, great. Thank you. Um, and if one is interested in the sector, how does one get expert support? I mean, you are an expert. <laughs> so how does one get expert support? I mean, you know, there, there are quite a lot of people that are here. Ajibala, you're also an expert and you're a consultant in the space. Um, and I think, um, you. you know, the, the cost of paying for experts to come and help you design your business, give you the advice, uh, give you introductions, it far outweighs the risk of going on your own and learning uh, by making mistakes. Um, I think uh, uh, very often people oversimplify businesses that are linked with agriculture. It is looked like the thing that it is the most, but when you look at it, these are the most sophisticated uh, where you should have the best minds, uh, both in terms of innovation, both in terms of raising capital, both in terms of really just driving and building processes and, and, and recruiting people and talent. So again, uh, um, you know, definitely I am for working with people that have walked the journey, have the experience and have the, inter the relationships and can help you broker those relationships. Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, okay, I, I hope Mr. Eziago is well settled now. Can you hear us, Mr. Eziago? Yeah, oh, I can hear you very well. You. Uh, welcome. Okay, welcome back. Uh, so you were going to tell, tell us about uh, identifying customers, uh, both locally and especially abroad, uh, and also to give us your idea of the regulatory landscape around agro logistics and trade related businesses. But I would like to take uh, the question on how to identify customers. I mean, many people here, that's, uh, I'm very sure that's uh, one of the key things people are looking for to, to know how to identify. It's taken that uh, any provide support in that area. In Thank you very much. Uh, finding yeah. market abroad. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so I'll listen Thank to you. Thank you. Um, like I said, um, NEPC uh, major function is actually to identify customers or uh, you know what's called buyers. We we'll call them buyers. 
for exporters. So if you are in um, an entrepreneur, I <clears throat> want to export, you want to sell locally or export. First of all, identification. If you have the product, like you said, a quality product and everything is in place, the first thing is do is to um, look for your customer. Looking for your customer to take many forms. We take care of uh, promotion. Uh, take note of that word promotion. Promotion means that um, how do you promote your product to other people? Now that can be direct. It can be direct. That means one on one. That means you have sales, uh, salesmanship. Uh, to, you, you sell from one person to another, of which we do. We also do it to exhibition. Exhibition whereby you take you go to trade fair, you go to trade fair, and um, from there you can identify customers who can um, who can see your product, you exhibit your product, and people will see your products. You know, you have the, your flyers, you have your all the things that are about your, pro, your product. The fly, fly actually is very key if you want to uh, sell your product. That flyer will tell you in case you are not there after you left, you leave the trade fair or you leave the, the event. The next day, somebody with that flyer, somebody can look for you. Another way you can also can also get customers is by advertising. You must advertise your product. Okay, um, if people, your product is in your warehouse or your shop. If you don't, nobody knows about it. So advertising is key. And advertising takes many forms. It can be um, it can be by radio, it can be by TV, it can be by you know um, by personal uh, you know recommendation. People take the product. Oh, it's very fine. Some of the product is now I, I use. I know, it's very fine. Use it, you know. So that's very key for oh, you online. because that oh, yes, yeah, online. Of course, online is that is. I'm trying to come to that, but I'm just trying to say so personal recommendation is key. Now, of course, online, like you said, social media now is the, is the end thing. So if uh, if you put your program product on Instagram, on, on Twitter, on uh, you know, on YouTube, and of course, a lot of people are making money out of out of that right now. So it's very key that you must identify. The appropriate channel because some of the appropriate number one is that it could be expensive. TV, for example, advertising TV in uh, this is expensive. You know, advertising radio is not cheap. But um, with the social media, I think it's coming cheaper now. You get a, a better channel whereby you, you get your products to the market without much expense. So that's actually for export promotion card. Like I said, our major uh, uh, this is to use the by using the trade fair. Trade fair is key for us, both local and external. Whereby you take your product, you go to SNR, um, to, a, to another country, another country, and exhibit. It's very, very effective. Another one is you attending exhibition. Um, I mean, I mean, just an exhibition of investment forum, uh, fora or something, or go on trade mission. You know, with chambers of commerce, you must also belong to an association, which does through the association, not the chamber of commerce or product association, you go on mission outside the country or if it's within the country from one state to another. Whereby you meet buyers. Of the of that product or people that use the product, see it, look at it. So you know, can you it, can you change it to this stage? Can you change the color? Can you change? You know that you can engage. You know and um, you know. So a lot of those are kind of factors you look at. Now, you are talking of regulation again. So, so you mentioned. Sir? Okay. Yes. Yes. I mean, just before before you uh, move into regulation, I just want to quickly uh, talk about uh, or ask. If there's, I mean, you mentioned Expos and all of that, and what NEPC does. So, um, is there a particular program that NEPC does, uh, a particular way that NEPC helps to advertise, take like this um, um, uh, um, entrepreneurs out of their products and showcase them in an expo or somewhere outside the country? Thank you. Or even within the country too. Thank you very much. Like, that's our actual major function within the country. We do we do um, promotions through the trade fairs. Like we, are, we attend the Lagos International Trade Fair, the Kaduna Trade Fair, the Enugu Trade Fair. These are international trade fairs within Nigeria. We also do look at domestic what we call domestic trade fairs. These are within the cities in Nigeria, whereby we take SMEs from that region or from the whole country, go there and exhibit it. Now from there we identify the good. Companies, then we now take them abroad. Abroad, we take them to. It depends on what you are doing. Um, for example, this year now we are preparing for Dubai Expo. Dubai Expo is the expo for the whole world. The whole world compare in Dubai. Uh, to about six months, they will be in Dubai, and so Nigeria is going to have a stand in that Dubai, and we are going to collect products from different producers who are efficient, who who meet the international standard, who have certifications, you know, and we take this product to to to, to Dubai, and they will be there for the product will be there for six months. And so that's why it's, the flyer is important. Believe, your information is important. I want to believe that yes. such programs, uh, logistics players can also can also have an opportunity. Uh, of course, of course. Right? We, can, 
we cannot carry it. I mean, logistics is clearly involved. We are taking product from 37, 37 states of Nigeria. Okay. The, the product has to move from Sokoto, from uh, Benin Kemi, from Medugri, from Lagos, and you know, from where the port will go to buy. So it's quite a, log a lot of logistics. Okay. So that's that, that, that logistics is okay. part of it. It can't be trade without logistics. So it's key to our, our program. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can then, you can now uh, talk about the regulatory landscape as you wanted to earlier. Yeah. Yeah. The regulatory landscape also is um, is basically key to our uh, both for logistics and both for for trade. Um. For example, you cannot produce without NAVDAC in Nigeria. You cannot do product without SON. Uh, if if it has to do with manufacture product, SON is key. You have to do food and drugs. Um, uh, you know. Then of course, if you want to export plant and um, but for logistics, okay, for, for logistics, logistics and warehousing. And warehousing now, now, the good thing about it is that the, the framework is being changed yes. now because the central bank has come in with trying to transform okay. the, where, the the commodity exchange system. You know, we just finished um, uh, an iterative section about a month or two ago on how to reposition the Nigerian commodity exchange. So a lot of, and I think we also used the opportunity to interview Mr. Balogun. That system is going to change. So a lot of regulatory things are coming up. And so that kind of uh, the depository system, the the commodity association, the commodity, you know, the receipts, the warehouse receipt system, you know, the you know all the regulation, the SEC is also coming into you know to adjust some of these things. So in fact, in the next six months or so, I see a lot of changes within the system, within the regulatory system. So, okay. Well, I hope these are yeah. all. Perhaps that you can just uh, shed a light on this. I hope or can can have a say on this. I hope this changes and uh, 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 enabling uh, measures are not necessarily measures to to uh, dampen or to hold back the entrepreneur. I hope they are more of enabling uh, no, measures. No, no, I think, no. Okay. If, if Central Bank can commit uh, so much money and time to this, and actually it's a presidential directive for the CBN, it's a presidential directive to change the because it, actually the commodity changes as uh, commodity marketing system is key to whatever you are saying. A logistic, if we don't have a, a, a very comprehensive and transparent commodity exchange system, they cannot do much. Apex now is doing it, a lot of challenges they are facing. But if the system is in place, we're talking about the warehouse system, for example. Now, if I have a, if I have a product and I want to take it to a warehouse where the logistics can take it to the port, there's no warehouse system where I can they do understand because standard is key. Grading and sorting is supposed to take care. I can also do it in that warehouse for security purposes. Buyers from outside the country, within the country, we trust we trust the warehouse system whereby I can put my product. Even the banks will also, you know, uh, have more trust on the warehouse system whereby I can deposit my, my product in the warehouse for that receipt. With that receipt I have, I can borrow money from the bank. I can say, oh, this is in that warehouse. You accept it at that warehouse and that warehouse. Because it's known, so uh, in fact, it's going to be a transformational uh, measures. So I want to please, it's going to be real, and the central bank is key to it. That's committing money to it, and a lot of things are, are happening right now. So I think it's a good thing for the okay. for logistics and associations. Uh, Thank you. I agree with you that it's a, it's a very great thing to do. Uh, did you? What do you think? Yeah, I, I completely agree with Mr. Isaiah Um, You know, when when government spends more time and focuses on the sector. It uplifts, you know, it's like the, the ocean moving with the wave tides, and every boat moves along with that tide. So we definitely see an opportunity to 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 move along with this tide uh, with increased focus and attention. Um, it's been a lonely journey, and uh, we're we're super excited with anything to central bank, Ministry of Trade, and all the other parastatas supporting, uh, you know, and looking at giving the commodities exchange. Uh, the right, the right um, uh, position it has in the entire food and commodities, uh, uh, and even other commodities besides agricultural commodities landscape. Now uh, we are absolutely sure that you know, as a private sector, as an entrepreneurial firm, we have the best innovation, we have the best technology, we have an infinite capacity to raise capital. So those will continue to keep us competitive um, in the space. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think um, with a short time left, we might as well talk about um, uh, the uh, impact of the ASCTA operations on the agro logistics and trade value chain. I mean, 
is it now going to be I mean, is it an opportunity for a logistics firm, meaning that they can take a product all the way from uh, from Sokoto down to Accra, uh, from Sokoto down to Tunisia, and all of that, and then they can have some more, uh, they can have some far-reaching uh, destinations. So what are your thoughts on how the AFCFTA would uh, impact the logistics um, and uh, trade markets. You know, uh, really, really, it's it's going to be radical, radical and positive, uh, to be honest, in terms of creating more opportunities. AFCTA, which uh, happens to be, have its second year anniversary today in terms of its launch, uh, so you know, really something we should be talking and celebrating. Um, it's, it's, it's going to be the largest uh, uh, trade agreement globally, uh, with 58 countries being, you know, eventually being. Uh, are part of that economic block, and then three trillion um, in economic activity. Every year. So it is three point four trillion dollars of economic activity every year. So it is by far, you know, the most important thing that will happen to agro logistics. And uh, you know, three things will define uh, uh, the future for Nigeria primarily here. So one is going to be um, increased value addition. Um, if we choose to continue to find ways to sell maize to every other country that also grows maize within Africa, then it's going to be a challenge. If we start to export our own brand of Kellogg's, uh, our breakfast cereals across the continent, then we do have a big opportunity. Uh, we have a million people to be able to feed. Um, and I think those will be one of the biggest things. How much can we accelerate our competitiveness? How can we accelerate value addition uh, and innovation in those, in those trades? The second part is going to be our infrastructure. If we do not invest aggressively at our infrastructure, both the rail, the, the road, the rail, the ports, and then the air, air infrastructure, uh, we're just not going to be able to prove. You can sell services digitally and deliver it via internet, but when you're looking at commodities and agro-related transactions, you have to put it on the truck, and you have to put it on the cabin on the rail, and you have to move those products. Today, it is cheaper to move maize from uh, the Black Sea region from, from Russia down to Apapa than it is to move it from Apapa to Ibadan. It is absolutely unheard of uh, for us. And until we are able to solve these problems, uh, we wouldn't be competitive. And, and we have to. So that's, that's a logistics that, opportunity, right? That is absolutely so a logistics, logistics opportunity. opportunity. Absolutely, absolutely, Ajibola. So if you look at it and say, we have a rail line from the port that comes out to Edo. We have another rail line from Edo that goes all the way to Ibadan. Can we create a business that can move wagons and move containers right from the port, right from the seaside, and just push it into a private uh, a port up, up country? And then when it gets to the port, so rather than you go and hassle and clear your container right from the country, you're coming right into the private port and your know, inland ports, and that's where you're clearing your container. It changes the entire dynamics, and these are opportunities that we have to continue to invest in. Same for the export corridor, um, the, 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 the Maradi Railroad, and what are the opportunities that that will provide? The Lakaji Trade Corridor, what are the opportunities that those things will be? There's been extensive studies about the opportunity. These trade corridors have existed for over four centuries. Uh, but the problem is we have to be competitive because this race to competitiveness is a race for all the countries in the world. And if it's not about how fast or how slow we are, the question is, are we fast enough with other competitors? Look at it, 10 years ago, Togo was not a significant port in the entire region. Today, Togo has the most sophisticated port in the West African region. They move more container per annum in Togo than we move in Apapa in Lagos. That's a country of less than 20 million people. We have 10 times their population, but less the capacity to move products in and out of the country. So until we're able to fix this critical infrastructure, we're able to increase you know, value addition, and we're able to unlock wholesale financing uh, 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 to the real sector uh, and the small and medium enterprises. Uh, Nigeria may unfortunately be a net loser uh, in the AFCTA um, rather than a net gainer. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Digit. You covered it.
kept recovered it, leaving just uh, about 30 seconds for Mr. Eziago to just uh, give us just uh, a short uh, his thought. Of course, we are coming back after. Uh, we have just about, uh, Mr. Eziago, if you can just quickly just tell us so that we'll come back with uh, questions from the public. And then we'll Thank you very that. much. We'll yeah, yeah. So yeah, the AFT, I think it's uh, a, a very short. Uh, I'll get back to you. Yeah, the ASTF is a big opportunity for Nigeria uh, in terms of logistics. Um, you cannot move product from here to Togo or to, to Central African Republic or to anywhere. Uh, but at this point, I want to say that um, Nigeria has a big opportunity. You know, um, if you go to Central Africa, um, if you go to West Africa, if you come to Southern Africa, Nigerian product is where it's of high demand. Okay? A lot of products been moved from Aba, leather products moved from Aba to, to Gabon, to Equatorial uh, Guinea, to Congos, and all that. You know, it's a logistic uh, uh, services needed there, and it's been done. Okay, so if with this, with the opportunity of the the, the African uh, Union present through the FTA, it means more opportunity for us. But like uh, Ayo Deji said, it's the issue of competitiveness is key. Uh, competitiveness is, is very very key, and that's why we are looking at options to able to reduce the cost of doing business. You know, for our, for, for our entrepreneurs and experts. Great, 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 great. Thank you so, thank you so much. Hold your thought there while we uh, come back to the Q and A uh, session, which is just going. We have just a very short time for that. Uh, we'll go on another short break, and then we'll be back. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, it's been a great time uh, filming or uh, providing insights. I mean, the have panelists filled questions on uh, or um, investing and also going into the business. So. Um, my question is, how is the NEPC supporting exporters in terms of market linkages and standardization? So, Mr. Eziago, how is the NEPC supporting exporters in terms of market linkages and standardization, especially for markets outside Africa? Uh, just a short one. Okay. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, actually, that's our major role. For market linkages, we do it in, in a lot of ways. Um, we provide um, what to call market information to exporters and to entrepreneurs. Um, if you register with us, we, we provide you with market information, the, price, the market, the buyer of the product, uh, where it is, the price, and the kind of uh, the, the specification the, um, the, the customer needs. That's market information. The second one is, like I explained, is by taking you to exhibition or international trade fairs. Okay? In the West Africa, we have a lot of trade fairs we attend. Uh, Accra, Senegal, with Dakar, that is Dakar, Senegal, we go to Liberia and all that. So well, we, that's what we do in the different part of the world, in the US and all that. So we do that. That's part of our 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 listing. So and like I said, the, the, we're also going to the Dubai exhibition, uh, Dubai Expo, which is coming up in uh, late part of the year. And after that, we're also going to other uh, other expos in the in different part of the world. Now, for standardization and qualification, uh, certification is key to us, and that is why we launched what we call uh, go go global go certification. Okay, yes. Yeah, if you look at my back, they say go go global go certification. We are trying to make sure that any product that leaves Nigeria is not rejected outside the country. And so that's why we're telling exporters and the entrepreneurs certify your product, certify your product so that at the end at the other market end it's not uh, it's not rejected. And so for now, we, we here I say what we are doing. Just last month we paid for we certified about uh, 15 companies to get. What you call HACCP certification. HACCP certification is just to, it's a, it's a manufacturing um, certification to show that oh you have you have the correct uh, you know process and procedures 
in my factory. Okay, we also have what we call the ISO, like I mentioned before, ISO 9001. We also have what called F FS22000. That's for food safety. So if you're in food pro uh, processing, you must have FS22000. This I help you to have packet linkage over the country. Okay. For, for the Thank sorry, you. sorry, lastly, for lastly for the FDA, for if you are going to US, there's what we call FDA. You cannot export without FDA. Export promotion cards have been helping companies to pay for FDA to obtain this FDA certification. So that I can have easy access to the market and other things we do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, so there's another question uh, which requires a quick um, uh, answer, and the um, questionnaire wants to know uh, wants to have info regarding licensing, certifications, batch capacities, and quantities for starting, maintenance costing, risks and profits, etc. In regards to the mini port services. Um, does the, do you want to talk about the mini port services? Just, I mean, unfortunately, the person would have to uh, get back to you. <laughs> but of course, maybe you can just uh, spotlight. So, Shippers some... Council. So, the Nigerian Shippers Council is a good one stop shop to get information, at least on regulation and opportunities. Uh, but again, I think this looks like you need a business plan help to be crafted. So you would need to reach out to a consultant and a specialist here. Okay. What opportunities are there to start a tech business in the logistics and trade sector? I mean, you mentioned it, but perhaps for the benefit of this person, you might as well just quickly uh, touch it again. What opportunities we are there to start a tech business in the logistics and trade sector? So, you know, when you look at tech, tech business models, so first is you want to reduce the cost of searching. So, you know, that's like the Uber for trucks. We have Coco 360, we have Lori, we have a few of those. The second is you want to also have some things around traceability. Can I know where the truck is any time of the day and can I track it? And this is an IoT play. You know, you have moisture controls um, that can say from my phone, I can know the temperature of a warehouse, uh, the temperature of a refrigerator, the moisture, the bacteria level. That's an IoT play that you can play there. And that's something that you can also explore um then there is the part where you look at insurance and other services and then you bring it together for the players on the space so if i have a logistics service provider for instance can i have a one-stop shop for every other service that i need to play i mean these are different innovations and you can tilt it and cut it into the place thank you I, I mean in addition to that i also think i mean uh for the tech sector can also help in trying to aggregate also the different logistics providers in such a way that at any point in time wherever anybody is they might be able to uh, uh to access or link up any logistic provider because many times that's also the problem that people face they don't know who is going to can ship what for me maybe from Akure down to joss you know and it, I mean, a tech company can easily find a way to link all of them together. Another question, which I think will be the last, is that uh, from Frank saying, uh, joining from China, that I would like to ask, what are the government incentives for exporters of agro products from Nigeria? Um, perhaps Mr. Eziago would uh, answer that by just telling him where to go or send, giving us an email uh an email that he can uh write to right yes uh, mr Jibala, thank you very much i think you are right because i can't mention the whole of incentives in just a, a, a minute <laughs> there's a lot of incentives available yes. I, I, I would recommend it goes to the nepc website www.nepc.gov.ng and um, then of course you can also share my number with him and my email so that he can also contact me privately so that i can okay. to provide for him but I want to say that uh, oh, okay. is, there, is there an info? Yes, is yes. There an info at NEPC? Of course, info at nepc.gov.ng. Yes, it's, 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 that's that's okay. Oh, that's okay. Yes, that's okay. I want to say that. Oh, uh, China, Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Hello. I'm listening. I mean, you can just. Okay. Finish. I want to say yeah, the guy from finish. China. Frank, I want to uh, uh, comment Frank from China, who is joining from China. Uh, meaning that uh, he's interested in uh, moving Nigerian products to China. So I want to ask him to um, uh, to contact me so that we can talk better because there are a lot of opportunities. And um, of course, logistics, again, is an issue. So um, we cannot talk about how we can move Nigerian products to, to China. There are a lot of opportunities now we have. And uh, so 
especially in the export promotion council, we are trying to move, um, you, I mean, try to move our product to different regions. Actually, we are trying to have what to call the, the where, I mean, the export warehouse. Now, not in Nigeria now, outside the countries. That means, if, for example, in China, in Beijing or Shanghai, we want to have a warehouse there where if, if anybody from Nigeria, anywhere, can come there, buy a giant product and move to, I mean, to go and sell or to eat or something. So it's an, it's an innovation we're also doing right now. And again, it involves a lot of logistics. So that's why I'm trying to bring it to the Oh, forum. great. Great. That'll be, that'll be a new one. That'll be a new one. Is and, it uh, a new one, yes. I pray everything goes well. It's, it's going well. Everything's yes, going I pray well. everything goes well. It yes. goes well. And, uh, yeah. So it's a wrap. Uh, as much as we would love to continue with the session as and also answer uh, questions posed by different people, uh, unfortunately, we have to go now. Uh, it's been an amazing time uh, sharing experiences, uh, providing insights. Uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Eziago of NEPC. Uh, thanks to uh, Ayodeji Balogun. You guys have shown your expertise, you've contributed your expertise. And I, I know, of course, with this, a lot of people would uh, also want to speak with you. And um, uh, I believe we can, we, can, uh, we can direct them to you uh, uh, with your permission. So, yeah, it's been an amazing time. Uh, we hope the viewers have picked up some tips for themselves. And... Uh, they can start from here and then take it to the next level, just as a practitioner like IODG has taken it from, you know, from a level to, uh, to greater heights. And the likes of Mr. William Eziagu of NEPC are also doing wonderful things to help enable the uh, business environment. Uh, so it's been a pleasure. My name is Ajibola Alfred again. As we go, uh, I'll leave you with this piece of advice. Um, Marco Potter says, overall industry um, attractiveness does not imply that every firm will post profits. And like I always like to say, uh, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail. Plan your work and work your plan. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Have a nice day. There's a story to be told, a future to behold. There is more to who we are than what they hear. We have love within our soul, fire in our bones. We've got everything it takes to make it here. There's much more within our soil, more than just our oil. We can grow the food to feed the whole world square. Agriculture is the key, there's treasure in the trees. The time is now, the land is green, wealth is here.
this is our nation, this is our land. 